everybody, and welcome to the very first episode of Ask the Anabolic Doc, starring Dr. Thomas O'Connor, and brought to you by anabolicdoc.com and metabolicdoc.com. And that's where you can also purchase his new book, America on Steroids, A Time to Heal. Let me get those websites right again, anabolicdoc.com, metabolicdoc.com. Kind of tongue twisters for me. Welcome, doctor. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Ron. Very happy for the first show. Yeah, this is going to be uh, this is going to be fun. Uh, we we just started getting questions. They're going to come pouring in, and I'm sure you'll do your best to keep up. So, first one is uh, from Nelson Muntz. He gives the following information to you: 48 years old, lifting since age 13, with the odd year off from training here and there, to well, abuse, drugs, and alcohol. Sober now, he's sober. Take a blood pressure blood pressure medication Ramipril now plus a calcium channel blocker beta blocker for same condition plus 75 milligrams of Seroquel at night and five milligrams statin went into hospital in September 2014 blood pressure 260 over 160 plus kidney failure due to above past lifestyle and untreated high blood pressure recovered from above still see nephrologist twice a year for caution Blood pressure also normal most of the time. Patient also went from almost two packs of smoke a day, which peaked in 2015, down to one to two cigarettes a day, does not use any other drugs. Last used anabolics in 2011, just some tests and EQ under a gram a week total, vary between 400 to 800 milligrams total. Question, would TRT be beneficial for this person or are there too many risk factors due to past issues? Patient is Canadian, so blood work and doctors are covered under health plan. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Now, Ron, this is a perfect, exact, well, similar. Every patient obviously has some similarities and there's differences independently. But so this is a man who's used steroids. Yeah. How old was he, Ron? How old? 48. 48 year old man. Yeah. Steroid using for a long time. Also, unfortunately, he's doing some other drugs and smoking some. So what pe these are things that people really do. Yeah. It's, a real life, it's a real life scenario. And he ended up in the hospital with a hypertensive emergency, correct? And kidney failure. So, and then he had acute renal failure, and then, and this is now in the post period. And does he? There's another case that's kind of there's. These are these two cases. They're both about hypertension, yeah. which is great, which is excellent. So, and they're steroid using. He ended up in the hospital with what's called a hypertensive urgency or emergency. They treated. He had acute renal failure, so his kidneys took a hit. Yeah. He was treated. He's out. Now, and now, how many years ago was that, Ron, that he had this episode? Okay, this happened in 20, September 2014, so a little three and a half years ago, three years and a few months ago. Okay, so that brings me, so 48-year-old man, this episode happened, and a lot of guys end up, unfortunately, because of these issues, not just steroids, men, people, but yeah. men end up in the hospital for hypertension. It doesn't just cause some steroids, men end up in there for medical issues. Sure. In the hospital, three years later, He's uh, drugs, alcohol, smoking, steroid use. He's out. Now he says years later, he seems like he's okay, yeah. and he's being followed by a nephrologist. Now you hear this? That's an expert in the kidney, and those are experts in hypertension. Okay. So he has, he has a general practitioner or some up there. I have a lot of Canadian guys. They come down. We take care of them. Some of the guys go to the borders afterwards, and we get labs done, and we get medical services done. In uh, the Board of Michigan, for example, I have a bunch of guys in, in Ontario, very cool, and uh, Canadian brothers, excellent guys. So, in the end of the day, is are his kidneys okay? That's the first question. Hmm. He obviously he has a nephrologist, so you would assume that he. And it seems like the nephrologist just checks him twice a year, and it seems doesn't seem like he's in kidney failure now. Yeah, right? he said for caution. So I'm I'm assuming by that that he means. Everything is fine at the moment, but he's just being careful and checking on it. So, so here's the thing. What I want to know from this man is now, because we, we're going to get to the question about the TRT, of course. Yeah. But the, the medical question is, Ron, and, and for all the people listening, did, wh how does your creatinine look? What is your, what is your kidneys? Uh, have they taken a hit? Are they damaged? Mm -hmm. He's on Ramipril. He's on an ACE inhibitor. He's on a calcium channel blocker, uh, a statin. These are very important basic medications. I use them very cautiously on men, man per man, every day for hypertension and for cholesterol and for protecting men for, for this, Ron. Mm. The heart, 
and these are blockages and you know we, we so this is what we do so this man is that man's kidneys does he is he living with partial kidney failure is he on the way to dialysis believe me they're all over the place so so is his nephrologist actively managing kidney disease secondary to hypertension and steroid use and genetics and the fact that he's 48 i mean hey i'm 53 so let's not call the 48 year guy let's not say he's let's not call him old yet that's so, me. Don't so, call me old. I'm 48. Right, Ron? So we want to. I mean, I'm living to 110. That's my plan. Wow. Who's coming to me? Who's coming? Why not? Let's. As long as your organs are good, live as long as you can. Quality life. Yep. So, back to this guy. His kidneys. The first question is, what is your kidney function really, sir? What's your what's your what's your glomerular filtration? Your 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 estimated GFR, and what's your creatinine then, therefore, hmm. or vice versa? And what's his echocardiogram? How does his heart look, Ron? So in all those pictures, and all of that picture, I should say, in a medical picture, we could look and say, after all the years of testosterone, two men came in today getting off steroids. They've been on steroids for 10 years. They have anabolic steroid in this type of bone out of them. So does, what's the man's testosterone about? And if he needs his testosterone, Ron, you know that all these men are going to be need to be on testosterone forever. Yeah. Okay. Now, but you need to have it diagnosed by an by an expert doctor that's going to integrate into this all the other pieces. That 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 if you just men just don't go on testosterone. Well, men do just go on testosterone. I mean, I'm, I'm, and, and they do. They just go on testosterone. And again, I'm not here to discriminate. And I'm, this is not what this program is about. The program's about once you're on testosterone or TRT, first of all, diagnostic the diagnostic aspects and then the management. So he's asking, what is he asking? Should I be, can I go on TRT? Would TRT be beneficial for this person or are there too many risk factors due to his past issues? Perfect. So does he need TRT? I don't know. Yeah. He's not a patient of mine. So you have to measure his testosterone levels. You have to do a history. You have to ask him how he feels, and if he's used steroids for years, like he says he has, you know that his hypo, hypothalamus pituitary gonad axis is most likely disconnected because he has a condition called anabolic steroid-induced hypogonadism. So let, me, let me ask you, doctor, how many people after 10 or more years of steroids ever recover their natural Ron, production? Roughly? What a, Ron, I could only make a guess. Yeah, if you had Near to guess. Near 100 percent. Really? Okay. Sure. Sure. Hmm. Ten years? It doesn't even take ten years. No, I'm saying how many re get their natural production back where they would oh, have, where no. they wouldn't need TRT? Close to zero. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. I, I didn't. I didn't interpret the question. I interpreted the flip side. Yeah, I was gonna say I was. That was a very optimistic answer there. <laughs> no, Ron. Common things are common. Yeah. When men use androgens, again, I'm not discriminating. When men use androgens and anabolic steroids for years, they don't come off. It's one of the biggest chapters in my book. Mm -hmm. Anabolic steroid-induced hypogonadism, and then after it says why men can't quit. And it comes down, it comes down, nothing to do with, it, this is not relative to kidney disease or cardiac disease. That's relative to you better be careful when you're on and how they could suffer and die. Okay, we see this. We we see it unfortunately all in the news now and the media, and 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 that's another topic. Yeah. But this one is: Does a man need testosterone? The regular guy that's thirty-five or forty has never touched touch a steroid in his life. He doesn't need testosterone. Right. But there are, and, and it's okay. But there's a bunch of men in the world, obviously that are, there are millions of them that they're self prescribing and they're taking antigens and anabolic steroids. Which again, I'm not hating on them. I'm just saying they do, and that disables the hypothalamus pituitary gonad axis, and that's called anabolic steroid induced hypogonadism. So the first question is, sir, is TRT necessary for you? Yeah. And that's a question that his doctor has to make with him. So I guess we have to run through a couple hypotheticals since we don't have all the answers. True. Let's, let's say that he is hypogonadal and he has. Uh, very low production, as confirmed over, usually takes at least two different two different sure. blood tests uh, a couple months apart, I suppose, to confirm that. But assuming that he has a legitimate need, 
and let's say his kidney function is normal, would you would you say he's a good candidate for TRT or, or, or is he too high risk? Well, I see. So let's, this is, these are the questions, but this is the best question in the world. God, we could almost do this the whole show because mm -hmm. this is going to exemplify so many different scenarios that I see so commonly. Yeah. So I have men, most men that come into me, they do steroids. Their kidneys are at the moment okay. But I do have patients, and I've even done a video. I just don't want to say the name. I've done a video of a pretty famous guy that's had severe kidney damage, and he may be on his way to dialysis. Mm. And that's not just steroids. There's genetics. There's, there's undiagnosed and managed hypertension. Mm. And then there's, of course, what I say, too much protein and too, many, too much Motrin. So, mm. But beyond that, so if his kidneys are indeed filtering properly and he has a normal kidney function, Testosterone replacement has is, has no ill effects on the kidney. Okay. We're not talking about super physiologic doses, Ron. We're not talking about trend. Okay. So and 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 super, you know, we're not talking about steroid doses. It's not the kidney on TRT that the literature and the feds they put the feds in 2015 put a risk increased risk on testosterone products. Forget steroids. Just testosterone for the for for the local guy, yeah. and it said it said there's a risk on testosterone, all all testosterone, androgel, you know, testim, uh, injectable testosterone, sipinate, propanate, enanthate, the reg testosterone testosterone that you get at CPS, right? It said, Ron, that men are at risk for for cardiac disease, heart attacks, stroke, and death. That's the exact words they use. Wow. It comes from it comes from two controversial studies in 2013, the VA study. That's a landmark study that was retrospective data, meta-analysis, well, retrospective data. And there was another study from UCLA, and that study was in 2014. And I think because of the, the, political, the political nature of testosterone and the government not knowing what to do, they pulled down those ads from TV from Andrew Jeff. Yes, that's right. You don't see, that was because of these two studies. Wow. The government, and again, I'm not a, I'm not against the government. I'm not an anti-government guy here. Okay, I ought to be careful here. They weren't sure what to do. They looked at the data. They took they had subcommittees and committee meetings with physicians, I assume, and they came back and they said, "Let's put this risk on testosterone. It looks like testosterone can cause heart disease, stroke, and death." Wow. Now, now, this year, up until they said, and then they were, they were, there were physicians at places like Cleveland Clinic and Mayo, okay, big medical institutions, that they've questioned the data. And now they came out just a few months ago, weeks ago, actually, and they've questioned and they say, funny enough, we feel that's not true. Huh. And testosterone may actually, in replacement doses, be safe and even protective for the heart. Wow. Now, Ron. Don't shoot the messenger. This, this is this is evidence-based medicine, and with the evidence, there's controversy. Not all of us experts agree, and we're there's there's we're interpreting the data differently. Yeah. Okay. So if this man needs testosterone, is is it too risky and dangerous? The answer is no. You need testosterone. You need it because you have low levels and you're suffering. Because of what you've done, I don't. There's no hate. There's no discrimination. Hmm. He fits the bill or not, and then you treat him effectively so he feels well. Hmm. Mood and libido, mood and libido. It's you don't treat for this, Ron. <laughs> well, that's funny, but that's great, and that, that's not steroids. Yeah. So, so that that's that you treat a man so he doesn't suffer, Ron, and then you look at the kidney and then the heart. Remember, the risks were related to heart, to stroke, death, cardiac, heart attack, stroke, and death. And it's controversial now. I can tell you this. Some men who have bad genetics for heart disease, you better watch them. Hmm. Those guys can have heart attacks without testosterone. So I mean, Think of all the people that have heart attacks every day. And I've Ron, never, never seen a steroid. Ron, I take it from a very, a very loving, caring from an internal medicine scientific approach, man per man. So that man needs to be evaluated by an expert who's who's a physician that know, and not just an endocrinologist. It could be an internist, could be a urologist, a doctor that his day job 
is diagnosing, managing men on androgen. But that doctor better understand kidney physiology and cardiovascular physiology and pathology. So, How many of these physicians do you think there are? I don't know. I mean, you know, this day and age, like I said, Ron, these physicians, physicians out there, first of all, there's APRNs and mid-level practitioners. It seems like there's not enough caregivers at all. So doctors are seeing 40 people a day. I'm blessed that I've created my own life where my day job is taking care of only men who may need testosterone, diagnosing them, and then I manage them very closely. And it's interesting that my management does relate to protecting the heart and the kidney and the prostate. And, and But I, I do it as an expert internist, and so that man, if indeed that man needs to get a full evaluation, he needs an echocardiogram, he needs his blood pressure checked constantly, of course, monitored. Those medicines are brilliant. They may not be the proper medicines for every man. So if he has heart disease, if he gets a calcium score, that's a coronary artery calcium score. Please, people, take notes on this. See a doctor and check into this. Forget steroids. Men have heart disease before women. Yeah. So forget all this stuff. If, if you want to live a long life, you're gonna, if you're gambling in Vegas, you're going to have a heart attack sooner or later. If you're a man, women later. So check to see if you have plaque in the artery. Get a coronary artery calcium score. It's cheap. It's effective. Any doctor that's, that's, that, that cares for you can order it in the United States anyway, outside, abroad. And you can see if you have plaque in the artery. Get an echo. That man, he's had echocardiograms because he's been hypertensive. It, is his heart in bad? Does he have left ventricular hypertrophy? Most men that come to me, Ron, that don't even have hypertension, that are, say, 40 and older, they already have a little LVH. Hmm. Now, is that an athletic heart? Or is that just an athletic, is that LVH? Does it lead to heart failure? All man per man. Hmm. Okay. All right, Nelson, here's your answer. Next question comes to us uh, from a gentleman named Devin Chaluk. Chaluk. Uh, I think a great question would be one on blood pressure. My doctor told me the problems with hypertrophy of the heart are strongly related to blood pressure, and so he has me on Ramipril, ACE inhibitor, and basically said, I want your blood, pres blood pressure as low as you can tolerate if you're going to be taking anabolics. Maybe if the doc touched on every possible way we can minimize those effects. My blood pressure is usually 108 to 115 over 65, being on 5 milligrams of Ramipril. So, yeah, I guess uh, wow. this question is you know, how to get his blood pressure lower. Let, let's just keep talking, okay, Ron? Yeah. Another great question. So let's go back to hypertension again. Did you know that, that the powers to be, I think a month ago, they just changed the guidelines for hypertension? It used to be you were hypertensive if you made if you made the mark of 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, systole, yeah. diastole. Now they lowered the bar to 130. Wow. So you're going to have so many more people now that are going to be diagnosed with hypertension. I'm not going to go into the editorial on that. So the, they lowered the bar because hypertension is dangerous. What does hypertension cause? And at the end of the day, it causes heart attacks and strokes and kidney disease not to mention ocular eye disease. So, common things are common. Like the guy before, hypertension, diagnosed, he ended up in the emergency room, it affected his kidneys, hopefully he's okay now. This other man is, is uh, seems like a man who's just had hypertension, he's, he's on steroids, he sees a doctor, wow, here's a doctor that I'll bet you he's an internist like me, and I'll bet you he's, Rampril is a good drug, Ram I'm on Rampril. Hmm. So, so it's an ACE inhibitor, so, He's looking at this man and he's saying, you're on steroids, you can, you're going to grow your heart, not to mention, you're going because it, it grows this, and yep. it grows, it can grow this. The Dr. Bagish, Aaron Bagish, Harvard University Medical School, last year, American College of Cardiology circulation, I'm just trying to download where this journal came from, out of my brain, and he, he, he Dr. Bagish showed us in a very well done study, Anabolic steroids do cause LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy. Ron, yeah, I didn't need to see that study because I see it myself, but but there's the study, and no one can argue it. Okay, this is great to grow. This heart, this muscle, you don't want to grow it because when you grow it and you get older, it's called heart failure. And if wow. again, if you look at 
those two autopsy reports, those guys both had massively enlarged hearts. And I believe Piano was in heart failure and he had a, a low ejection fraction and his kidneys were taking a hit. And we're not going to go into the politics. It's just, it's true. I, mean, I was a doctor, but in the end of the autopsies, you're not talking about toenail fungus disease here. We're talking about internal organ disease. In the end of the day, when you damage your heart and your kidneys, not to mention lungs, game over. So if you live long enough, th that's going to hurt anyway. So you can see where I'm going. Yeah. Blood pressure, hypertension. If you're over 130, over if you're if you're greater than 130, greater than 80, if you're in that mark now, you're hypertensive. What do you do? We always go to to the holy the, the, the holy grail is diet and exercise, low sodium. Um, anabolic steroids can cause some hypertension. A lot of genetics on it, depending on how much you take. If you're taking Tren and D-Ball, Masteron, D-Ball, Anadrol, you're taking a gram of... Ta I mean, young men, funny enough, they're not hypertensive. Why? You know why? They're no. young. Because <laughs> they're young. They're young. They're just resilient. Yes. Yeah. And then they get older and they're hypertensive. It doesn't mean that during that during that period they're not enlarging the heart. So this doctor is, tr this doctor is treating this man and he's saying, you're on steroids. <laughs> I, he seems like a sweetheart. He's saying, I want to protect you. This is brilliant. This is the stuff I do. Let me show you the way. Let me get an echocardiogram. Let's look at your labs. Let's get your blood pressure. Please stop steroids. Take the lowest possible dose. If you need TRT, we'll give you the lowest sustainable doses. We can measure the estrogen all this all, all day long. And then in the end of the day, if you have a little left, left ventricular hypertrophy, not to mention if your kidneys may be starting to get damaged, Let's try to reverse everything and stabilize everything. ACE inhibitors are for Caucasian. Now, hypertension this should only be dealt with and managed by an expert who's an internist. An internist should do this, okay? Yeah. I mean, family practitioners, guys can do it, but ob guys, don't let me deliver babies. <laughs> no, no, do not let me deliver babies. Yeah. And don't let me operate on prostates and kidneys. That's a urologist. Yeah. And don't, a podiatrist, they're the best guys in the world. They work, thank God they're there when you break your feet. Yeah. But don't any of these die. And chiropractors, I love chiropractors. But please, when you're dealing with hypertension, anything with the heart, the liver, the kidney, this should be a board certified internist. Okay. It's super complicated. So blood pressure, the diagnostic aspects and management of blood pressure. ACE inhibitors for most Caucasian men, that's the first one to use and baby doses of diuretics. But I don't use all this stuff. I, I use it man per man. So if he, if he's hypertensive and he's, one again, 130 up over on the bottom, up over into the upper 80s and 90, if he's over that 90, so then no, I said 80 before, it's over 90, excuse me, it's a long day, I'm tired. Yeah. Very simple. If he's hypertensive, you should cut sodium chloride, do diet and exercise, plant-based diets, and mo if you if you can sustain that, it works. You're great. Your heart's not damaged. It's not enlarged. You don't need medicine. Hmm. And all the all the natural things, some of those things are, are are work quite well, but they're just not as strong as real meds. And at the end of the day, if he's got a large heart, he's on steroids. It's not a bad idea. Here I am to use an ACE inhibitor at night to just modify the blood pressure and to protect the kidneys and protect. The heart. So that is br that is brilliant. But again, you know, don't do it at home. <laughs> don't order it. Don't order Rare Pro from China. So <laughs> is that the question? Was that answered, Ron? I think so. I wasn't really sure what his question was. Maybe Doctor just his heart. He's on ACE inhibitor. Doctor just warned him to uh, lower his blood pressure as much as possible if he's well, okay. on anabolics. Okay, so wow, so Ron, we don't have studies. So if you you can't, you don't want to lower the blood pressure too low, right. you, you'll feel horrible, and you can probably get well, you can pass out driving the car. Mm -hmm. But if I mean, no one, how many people are taking blood pressure medicines and really living too low? If that man's blood pressure is one hundred six over seventy something, he, some people walk around. A lot of women have those levels, one hundred over 60, 70. That's actually normal for them. Hmm. Men. You know, what, you know what perfect blood pressure? Optimal blood pressure. Less than 120, less than 80. 110 over 70. Okay. Now, I I keep my blood pressure at 110 over 70. 
I happen to use a little Ram Pro and a little baby doses of Bistolic when I'm not mountain biking crazy and so on and so forth. It's very complicated. Yeah. But in the end of the day, but, but, but when you get older, Ron, that you can't look at those numbers and say a 75-year-old man or woman you're going to bring them to 110 over 70. That would, that's, that's stupid. It's, it's against the rules. You hurt them. So, you see, it's based, see the variables, Ron? Yeah. It's, it's very complicated. So you can't just give the guy, you, it's, this is so personal. You can't just, there's no data, but God knows we're getting there, Ron. Do we give ACE inhibitors? I do this. I try to do this. I give ACE inhibitors to, to men that have upper level normal hypertension, uh, Upper limit, upper upper limit, normal blood pressure, and frankly hypertensive. I do work on these agents because I protect them, Ron. It protects their arteries, their heart, and their kidneys. Hmm. ACE inhibitors. Okay. But again, my God, Ron, you people have allergies. They can get a cough, not a trend cough. It's an ACE inhibitor cough. And yeah. but and there's a mechanism shifted. If you if you watch if you read one of my articles on trend cough. Yeah. I wrote. I think it's it's on my it's on my site. Trend. What is trend call for? Mysteries about trend. Yeah. And yeah. I speak about the overlap of the bradycardia and the ACE inhibitor cough with trend cough. So there's some crazy mechanisms I discovered with this trend cough that's similar and in part uh, related to bradykinin and ACE inhibitor cough. But you, every man, Ron, has to be cared for independently. You can't right. just be giving you know ACE inhibitors. I'm not saying that, but it's brilliant if a man has an LV, a, a large ventricle, and he's hypertensive, and he tolerates that drug well, that's going to save his life, Ron. Okay, cool. All right, I came up with a question because I watch, I watch TV, and I see these commercials for uh, Nugenix and all these testosterone booster products, and there's yeah. even one for something that looks like a, a kit of growth hormone. It's supposed to be growth hormone. So obviously, these companies are making a lot of money and selling a lot of products. Yeah. So my my question to you is, I'm sure a lot of men see that as I'm not going to go to the doctor and bother with all that TRT and all that nonsense. I'll just buy this. How viable an option are these products to seeing a, an actual physician and getting prescribed TRT and being you know followed up with a with a doctor? Wow. Now this stuff, Ron. You know, it's been a while. I'm gonna. I got. I drew a little diagram for this question today. Okay. So we'll have fun in a minute. So wow, so testosterone boosters. We can. We're gonna, that's the. That's the question. Yeah. You know. So what are testosterone boosters? Do they work? How do they work? And are they sustainable? And what do they do? What side effects do they have? Wow. That's that's the question. Yeah. So wh let's go back to the mechanism because I'm a I'm a scientist. I have to I have to always go back to the mechanism of how does it work. So see that is that yes. a good you see the brain. You see the balls down here? Oh, is that what that is? Okay. Balls. You see the brain? Yeah. Looks like Trump. It's a Trump hair. It's Trump hair. <laughs> it's Trump's brain. Okay. okay. So, so we got the balls. We got, this is primary. This is about hypogonadism. Okay. We have primary, which is where the testicles are affected. Secondary is pituitary. Tertiary is the hypothalamus. Remember that, you guys, remember this? Remember the bro, this is all for you bro scientists out there. Hypothalamus pituitary testicular axis. Remember that? Sounds familiar. So, so it goes down. It's it's a, it's a, it's it's in, it's intact together. So what what you have the, what these agents do? And let me just do a list of these agents. So there's there's many agents from Yohimbi, which works a little bit, can cause hypertension. There's there's herbal test boosters. There's deaspartic acid. There's ZMA, zinc mechanisms. You know what's incredible? I saw Sergeant Steel, and I checked that out. Yeah. And, oh, again, uh, this is this this is a non-judgmental zone. I'm a scientist. Th that's these guys are just. It probably works at least for the sh for the short run hmm. because they've added every single. I got the list. Wow. You asked a question, Ron. I got. <laughs> yeah. the, you asked a question. I was ready. You were prepared. I was, I'm prepared. I did my work today. Wow. This is the lunch. I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> Magnesium, vitamin D, zinc. There's D, D, A, D, asperic, aspartic acid, KSM, nettle extract, fenu. See, this is stuff I used to focus on years and years ago. I'm, I'm an expert now taking care of men that are 
using real steroids, TRT, and I'm here to protect them. Yeah. Tribulus. Tribulus works. Boron. So, okay. So, Ron, there is... These are natural agents, roots and barks, I call them, roots and barks, yep. and herbal agents, and some of them are minerals and amino acid complexes, right? Yes. Where do they work, Ron? So these, they work anywhere, mainly in the brain, and not to mention some of them are working directly in the testicle. Hmm. Ron, it's so complicated. So there's multiple mechanisms where they, in the end, they either stimulate from the hypothalamus region mm -hmm. or pituitary, Ron, in that yeah. eye in, or they just stimulate the Leydig cells, interstitial cells, in the balls directly, or they work on, I was reading about, it's fascinating, they, they work on increasing, increased GNRH, which is gonadotropin releasing hormone up in the top brain, basically the hypothalamus. And, and if you look at inhibin, leptin, and insulin does the same thing. So Ron, these things are complicated. I'm I'm working on the medical side of once guys take real, you know, at the end of the day, Ron, let's face it, the test boosters may actually work. Okay. They, 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 they work. I've seen guys, this is what, my 13th year of being the anabolic doc? Got, doc, I, I come in for a consult. Look at my testosterone levels. They do little studies on themselves. Here's my test level before. Yeah. Say an example, this is not a guy who's using steroids. I, I've done my test levels, Doc, that I took Sergeant Steele or, or back in the day, Metal Root, you know, or Yohimbi or something. And they, Doc, look, it's up six weeks later. And then, but now six weeks after that or six months after that, either they're on it or they're off it. And they end up not, they end up not staying on these agents for very long. And if there's pro-hormones involved, which these are not natural test boosters, yeah. those are really... Ron, those are those are steroids. <laughs> those are they're, they're really they're they're really steroids, and that's a whole other topic. And they're just you know how is the line crossed? Where is a lot? That's just a kind of a medical supplement legal argument. What the agent is it? And in the end, the brain sees it, Ron, either in the top part of the brain, the lower area, the pituitary, or the balls, and that's it. Because in the end, if it's really so it's stimulating your own production naturally. Yeah. And, then, and then it goes into, can we block the estrogen levels, which is true in some of the studies, to liberate your own free testosterone? <laughs> yes. So the, 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 aroma, the weak aromatase inhibitors, the natural ones, there's a variety of them. I, I can't memorize these. But, yeah. you know, real aromatase, there's been studies, Ron, hypogonadal men, not from steroid use, just... Got organic guys, you know, older men, low T, probably diabetes, metabolic, genetics, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, smoking, drinking, and they have low T, and then they find out, they saw years ago, they have a higher estrogen level, and then they, they tried, they did studies where they blocked the estrogen with aromatase inhibitors. Hmm. And they found out that it actually did stimulate, at least in the short run, an yeah. increase in free testosterone. It does work, it's science. But in the end of the day, Ron, is it sustainable? Good question. I, I just don't, there's no study that will show you that. Like, let me see a study on any of this stuff that's gone on three years. Yeah, I mean, have you ever dealt with a patient that was on one of these natural test boosters for, you know, a very extended periods? No, no, never. I've seen thousands of patients. In the end of the day, they all end up just on tests. Yeah. I mean, this is the truth in the streets, or or nothing, or they just don't. But then I don't see them, I guess, right? right they don't right, come. Right, right. <laughs> so a lot of men don't. There's a lot of men that just that just. I mean, this is a group of men that are using, looking for hiring. There to, I mean, 25, 35 year old men, if they're healthy, the average bear has a normal testosterone level. But hold on, he may not like that. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me a lot of the people that gravitate toward these products aren't necessarily anyone who has a legitimate uh, you know, need for it. It's someone looking for that extra boost, but they're either too afraid of steroids or they don't know how to get them. So they see these ads or they see the TV commercials. So I'll just get that. and They're hoping for the best. I, I would imagine, I would hope that people that have a legitimate hypogonadism wouldn't think this is a viable option to get something off of an infomercial. 
Know. You know what, Ron? So men need to get checked. But that brings me to the to a kind of related topic is so men are boosting their testosterone with all these agents, both herbal, mineral, and other. And then you have men that come in, they're either hypogonadal or they're low normal, and they don't want T. So we have to consider to give them Clomid or HCG. Now that's and that's a whole other interesting topic because I do do that for men. And then, of course, you have the maintenance of fertility, and then, of course, we use those drugs in post-cycle therapy. All right, let's get to uh, another question. This is a long one from Ben One. Ben's over in Europe. Uh, he says, hi, Doc. Something strange had happened to me a couple of years ago. I never got an explanation. I had a lot of stress in my business. One day, I'm standing in my living room, and the whole room starts to shake, like very strong. I had to sit down because I was losing my balance. It felt like my brain was shaking for five minutes. After that, my brain was foggy and cloudy for the next five days, and I could not see clear or hear right. A couple weeks later, I felt dizzy and my head was heavy. I knew I had to go to the hospital quick, and luckily it is only a two-minute drive away. I was all by myself, and while I was driving, I felt like a dream and swiveled over the street. I told them I needed to see a doctor, thinking I have a stroke slash heart attack. They took my blood pressure. It was 220 over 220. Everybody was panicking, and they gave me medicine over the next four hours. My blood pressure went all over the place until a specialist came and checked me out. He gave me Rivitrol drops, and within 30 minutes, my blood pressure was normal, and I went home. They gave me blood pressure meds, but I never took them. My blood pressure is normal. I never had another problem. I'm 57. This was three years ago. I did follow-ups, also blood work and everything. All came back perfect. Never did I have another issue or high blood pressure after that. The specialist had no clue what happened. I feel great, work out hard, take 250... I assume milligrams of testo and anthate a week since eight years. It is a complete mystery. So I guess he wants to know what, what happens. You know, this is this is real stuff. So that's like, these are all stories from the ER. You can call it tales from the crypt. These are called, <laughs> these are called tales from the emergency room. Obviously, I worked for years in the emergency room, part when I was training my residency training in New York City and Hartford, uh, Connecticut. So the guy had, an, again, it's another guy with, it's called hypertensive emergency and he didn't you know he's, he's a sweet guy but he's you, you're never gonna have 250 over 250 it's gonna be the top number is always higher at least a little bit than the lower but yeah. it was 250 over 150 or 200 over a hundred and something 50 which is probably it's probably 250 150 it's okay that's okay no. technical, technical details so the guy that's that's massive hypertension so he's in the ER they run all the tests they check him for a heart attack a stroke kidney so that's why I asked, I actually posted on this. Yeah. You need to get, so now imagine this. This is, We do this all day long as doctors, right? How long ago was that? Eight what years ago. Yeah. Okay, so, so what we say, how are you feeling today? Great. Oh, I'm sorry, three years ago, three years ago. Well, but three years ago, so yeah. you didn't die. You didn't have a stroke. What was that? We don't know, but what happened to him in that period? So what does that mean when these, in, let's talk about two things. When you're in the ER, what do they do? They, they, they have to, that's an emergency. They don't just bring the blood pressure down immediately, by the way. Hmm. These are smart emergency room doctors. They have to be very careful because if they rapidly de deplete someone, if they're having a stroke and they're bleeding, that you can make a worse condition. They have to assess what's really going on and that they do the ABCs, you know, airway, breathing, cardiac. So they do that. They check for heart attack, strokes. They look at the kidneys. And they now the medicine they gave them was is it's not American medicine. I looked into what it was. I thought it was like an ACE inhibitor. Yeah. It's clonopin. Hmm. So blood, blood thinner? No, no, no. It's, it's, clonopin. Clonopin. it's a it's a benzo. It's a it's a relaxer. It's a, it's an anxiety. So if you look at if you just put these pieces together and you're just guessing, if you're a doctor in the emergency room, you're going to say he had some he had some a panic attack. A panic attack. Yeah. Hmm. He has some massive panic because you know you imagine and the docs are over in these they're they're great in there over in or, or England we have tons of patients over there you know they pop into the ER they do their boom 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 they do the ABCs they check them they he he's I assume had an echocardiogram but one thing when you're older he's that's not old though he was fifty something years old then yeah one of the things so I'm just trying to be a savant for this so he's not a patient it's not in front of me you you have to think of why could someone who otherwise is either hypertensive but but mild or stick and they pipe up renal artery stenosis, feel chromocytoma, or other endocrine neuroendocrinopathies, and that's for my med student. That's for the med student in the room. 
So that's what they do, Ron. So, but you're telling me three years later that he doesn't have any of these things. Yeah. So that was an that was an isolated episode. I mean, this is just being a regular internal medicine doc in the ER. Episode came and went. They they gave him they gave him some Ativan basically, and and they thought there was nothing organically medically to treat, and they sent him home. And now his blood pressure is perfect. He never had that. He's never had that symptom. So obviously he didn't have an aneurysm in the head, did he? Well, probably not, right? He'd be dead, wouldn't he? Well, yeah. That, see, that's isn't that easy to diagnose? <laughs> I mean, so he, heart, you know, you know, you know, strokes, heart attacks, kidney. You, it's all the same stuff. And then, and and so, but now every person should check all those things. And does he have hypertension now? If he does, he should be. I mean, but I think we answered the question. So there's nothing. That was from that was a acute episode of uh, panic disorder or something. This is crazy. How many of these questions are about blood pressure? Next question is from House. Any thoughts on cardiotone? Cardiotone for blood pressure control. It, the, the, I, you know, the, I looked up that that that's a natural ingredient. I just have no thoughts on that. Oh. There are natural ingredients, you know, that can certainly lower blood pressure. The, you know, the CoQ10 and there's certain I don't even know, you know herbal agents and they they do work. They work a little bit, Ron. They work a little bit. My and again, I'm a basic guy. My feeling is eat well, train right, live right, have one or two drinks a day if you're a man, the wine, don't smoke, don't be abusive, don't do steroids. If you do, please try to get off. If you need testosterone, you know, be on testosterone, don't take too much. If you need it, be careful, watch the heart, watch your body and live a long life. You know, in the end of the day, if if you have a little hypertension, uh, my, I have a shirt. It says "Better Living Through Chemistry," Ron. Yeah. <laughs> so all these agents are really going to have, you know, they're and again. Some people are going to hate me because I'm a pharmaceutical pusher. I just see it that a little baby dose of ACE, all those drugs, they basically mimic or the pharmacy, the pharmaceutical companies decades ago mimicked what the drugs did, but they made them stronger. They make them better. So we have six different statins. We have five or ten more ACE inhibitors. So those are the mechanisms. I just happen to like to use tuning doses of real blood pressure medicine, ACE inhibitors, hydro so selective cardio selective beta blockers, small doses of, of calcium channel blockers, small doses of diuretics. It's all patient per patient. And there's a few other drugs that we use, but there's really like four or five classes that we use. Yeah. If you use, if you, if you use them early, before, when someone's just getting hypertensive and you see that they can't do the diet and exercise, you, you don't hang them out to dry. Give, if you have a great doctor and that doctor can find just the right medicine for you, and if you're, if you're losing weight and you're coming off and your pressure's going down, just you hold the medicine. And then if you go to the, then you come into the holidays and gain weight, you go back on the bed. So opposite. Hmm. So I don't know what that, that agent is. I'm just not aware of that's a natural ingredient, you know, natural substance that may actually modify the blood pressure to some degree. But you know what, Ron? I've never seen anyone come to me, and this is my 13th year of business, sustained on some natural ingredient. I'm just... Maybe other, you know, natural paths probably have it all the time. Yeah. And not me. I mean, just real quickly, what would be the issue with, why would somebody be wary of being on a low dose of an ACE inhibitor? Is there any, you know, any Ron, common risk? That's a great, that? that's a great question. Of course, there are side effects to all these medicines. That's inherent in being an expert internist. You have to know exactly how to ma ma diagnose and manage, and you have to know these drugs inside and out. Yeah. That's what these I'm training these meds to. That's why these this is what it's clinical medicine. So in my opinion, you don't use medicines, obviously. <laughs> no doctor's gonna argue this unless you need them. But you know, on the, on the flip side, there's so many people that are not controlled blood pressure for multiple reasons. They don't go to doctors, they, they don't get in, they don't have insurance. So in the end of the day, you use the dose just enough perfectly to treat them with minimal to zero side effects, and you watch them closely. Why would you start a medicine or a herbal, if a herbal agent works, that's great. Mm. You, there are some people that, you know, there's some people that 
are adorable. They take small do trinket, you know, drops of herbal medicines. I don't want to. I'm not being. I don't want to be a wise guy. I don't want to disparage. Yeah. They take drug. But doctor, my blood pressure is perfect. You did, your blood pressure is perfect anyway. You, your blood pressure is perfect anyway. Well, you understand know what I'm saying, Ron? Yeah, yeah. If that person, if that's not going to hurt them, I let people. Of course, if they're the boss. You're the boss. You're the patient. You're the boss. <laughs> All right. Well, we have one last question. Of course, it's blood pressure related. This comes from Swaminator. Uh, I've been prescribed Bistolic for high blood pressure. Bistolic, Bistolic. After watching your video, I see there are some side benefits related to nitric oxide production. I train in the morning. Should I consider taking Bistolic about 30 minutes before I train, or is it better off being taken the night before? My instructions simply say take with or without food at the same time every day. So he's looking to get some extra benefits out of his blood pressure medication, correct? Best question we got today, maybe. Okay. Best question. All hypertension. Today's hypertension day. That's great. <laughs> so first off, Swiminator, thank you so much. I saw that on the, on the new blog, and I love his avatar. Well, that's crazy avatar. It's a pro wrestler. It looks like King Kamali, maybe? That's Abdul, awesome. Abdul, I think it was Abdul. I was like, one of those guys. I said, is that him? That wasn't no, him. No, okay. No, so that I love, I love the, I love the avatar. So thank you so much. What a great question. He he's seen my my other videos. Thank you so much. So bistolic. I mentioned it before, actually, probably quick. I mentioned it. It's a cardio selective beta blocker, and on low doses, it it's a, it works by vasodilating for the hypertension to vasodilate as a beta blocker would to relax. The smooth muscles around the arteries and the and the arteries open up a bit and the pressure goes down. On bigger doses, it actually lowers the heart rate and and, and that's a beta blocker. Mm. And obviously, this drug is very interesting. That this drug is called Bistolic Navibolol, and it came into the country years ago from Forest Labs. I'm not trying to pump any pump to them. Forest Labs, and they got what's called a DEA. They had a ticket, which is you know they they have to they have to do studies and show what this is for in yep. Europe it's 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 widely used in Europe for for greater uh, for more indications other than hypertension but the smart company they want to bring it into America and sell it is it is it, they don't want to spend millions of dollars just a, a million or so so they have one indication only hypertension metoprolol and other other uh, generic non-selective even non-selective beta blockers have many indications they're broadly used, so they brought this in, and it, you, it's it's an amazing drug that, in addition to the lowering of blood pressure effects, it, it's a nitric oxide doning endothelial agent. Did oh, you get all that, Ron? Did you get that, Ron? Sounds to me like it's uh, like Cialis or Viagra. It is. Listen to this. Yeah. So, in, when I first when it first came in the country, I don't know, ten seven years ago. I, I go to some of these drug rep dinners. I get a nice, I, get, I hear a great speaker, and I get a good dinner out of it. Nice. Okay. So I get to, and I get to learn, and it's really fun. I meet cool doctors that are talking. I went to a few of the Bistolic guys, and I was amazed to find out at that time that this is a cardio selected beta blocker in low doses, basically under 10 milligrams, and more like 5 and 2.5 milligrams. It actually can really work. We're not going to say it's Viagra, but do you realize that it can it can work synergistically with Viagra? Be careful, hmm. and it doesn't. It do, but imagine this: a man has has blood pressure, maybe he has an arrhythmia or a heart attack. A doctor gives him a beta blocker, Ron. Yeah. He, he doesn't feel good on it, and it wrecks his sex life. So hmm. I love to get with with always with cardio cardiovascular cardiology approval. I commonly. I asked the cardiologist, doctor, is it okay? Do you agree? Can we switch this patient from the topolol to bistolic? And not one cardiologist has said no to me. And the man, the man feels better. He feels he, he less fatigue. And doc, thank you because my sex is my hormones are definitely better. Ron, this yeah. is the best. I think this bistolic question by the swiminator is the question of the day. Okay, good job, Swaminator. <laughs> Let's see if he can top it next week. So his question is, when should he take it if he wants to get benefits toward his training and a better pump? Does it matter? 
Great. So I'm not as, always in his system. I'm not his doctor. So you see what's going on underneath now? Disclaimer, 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 disclaimer. I'm writing this, I'm writing disclaimer for my mother. Yeah. <laughs> writing this guy. Not a, I'm not the guy's doctor. Yeah. Okay. So this medicine is a once a day medicine. It's given once a day. Now, so what the, the medicine is once a day. The man should understand that if he's taking this medicine and he takes it and if he's doing cardio, if he's riding a bike or a treadmill, it could put a cap on his submaximal and maximal heart rates, right? Yeah. It's a beta blocker. I told you that if it's a lower dose, it doesn't cap, it doesn't limit, it, it doesn't act like a beta blocker on the heart rate as much as, say, metoprolol does. But it, it still may. So I find that my patients, we may want to use that drug at night. Okay. Or if his blood pressure, if, if, but if he's training at night, that per, this particular man I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. he takes it during the day because his blood pressure is going to be high during the day because he's a salesman. He works in an office and he's stressed. He's has some stress. So you see, that's a very particular great question, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a man per man question, but it can relate. So maybe he doesn't want to take it before exercise if it's going to put a cap and make him feel fatigued, you know, on his heart rate. So let's assume that he doesn't, he's not doing cardio, he's trying to get his pecs pumped or his arms pumped. He trains in the morning, should he take it, should he take it with breakfast and then go to the gym a couple hours later? It, it, it's probably, you know, for, for man for man, it probably, he doesn't even, and it's not gonna give him a nitric oxide pump, it's a good question though. Oh, okay. You know, it's a, that's an, I've heard that, I've had that question. Doc, does it give a nitric, well, I think Viagra and Cialis actually do give Real pumps, though those drugs, because those are those massively, those directly increase by inhibiting uh, phosphodiesterase. They increase nitric oxide in the endothelial tissue, certainly of the, cap, the corpus cavernosum and the penis. Yeah. But they do it all over. That's why they're kind of they're amazing drugs. But apart from that, if he if he takes it because he should take it every day, so he doesn't forget, take it every morning with food, without food, take it, and he his blood pressure is controlled on that dose. And he goes to the gym and he gets a nice uh, chest workout, dumbbell presses, bench pressing, have a spotter, and he feels good. He's all set. All right. Wow, that's been actually a pretty good round of questions for episode one, I think. Yeah. Tired, Ron. Tired. <laughs> how many hours? How many hours work between you know you practice and outside? If you had to estimate, how many hours do you work a week? All together, everything. I work about sixteen hours a day, Ron. Yeah, I, it's not work. I actually, oh, I, I don't, I work, you know what my work is? Doing the banks, doing the business stuff, it's, and even that sometimes. So I, I work, I start seeing my patients around 9 o'clock, 8.39 in the morning. Yeah. I've been up in the morning early with emails and write, I'm writing, I'm a writer now, of course, we're yeah. writing for years. We're writing, we're, we're writing another book right now, and I write articles and stuff, as you know, and then I start, I take, my patients are always emailing and stuff, which is great responding, working with my office staff, and then I'm in for about nine to about four or five. I clean up in the office, I'm still doing things, and then I go home, I will train twice a week with the weights, and then I mountain bike, fat biking, and then I'm back to work around 9.30 or 10, and I go to bed around one in the morning. Wow, jeez, God does, love does you. Does everyone do this? But, that's, but you know what, I don't work, I'm not working. I'm so happy, it's not work. Well, there you have it. I had a feeling you uh, put in those kind of hours, and you just confirmed it. So, good on you, mate. Good on you, mate. All right. Thank, thank you. So we're going to keep this thing rolling. We want to do this every week. So everybody, keep the good questions coming in, please. We have the thread on the MD forum and Dr. Con Dr. O'Connor's uh, section in the forum. It was, uh, you know, it was inactive for a couple of years. It's 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 up again. It's ready for you to start posting again. And you can get your questions answered right here by the anabolic doc. Thomas O'Connor himself. So don't be shy, everybody, especially you guys who really need answers to these things. He's here to help. So that's been a great first episode, Doctor. Good job. Thank you so much, Ron. I really enjoy it. Keep the questions coming, folks. And in the meantime, everybody, don't forget to check out his websites, anabolicdoc.com and metabolicdoc.com. For uh, MD and the Anabolic Doc, this has been Episode 1. We'll see you next time.